Welcome to the Unsweetened Sayo podcast. My name is Siobhan Harris. I am a certified integrative nutrition health coach and the founder of unsweetenedsayo.com. I gave up all sugar and all flour on January 13th, 2018, and am finally free of my addiction. My mission is to help other sugar addicts find their path to freedom and live the sweet life without sugar. Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 30 of Unsweetened Sayo, the podcast. I am super excited today to be with Dr. Vera Tarman. She is the medal director for Renaissance, one of Canada's largest drug and alcohol treatment centers. She spearheaded their new in and out patient programs in food addiction. She is author of the book, Food Junkies, Recovery from Food Addiction. And she is also in food addiction recovery herself, having maintained a 100 pound weight loss for over 10 years. She can be reached through her website, addictionsunplugged.com. Wow. Welcome, Vera. So happy to have you here today and talk with us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, uh, having me. Well, this 100-pound weight loss, that is amazing. I don't weigh myself, and I have so many people ask me, uh, how much weight have you lost? So I kind of always have to, to guess, and I, it's probably been somewhere around 60 pounds. So 100 pounds just seems amazing. If just to start, you would just tell us a little bit kind of about your story, your own personal journey with food addiction. Um, okay, I'm going to do that, but let me just say in, in relation to what you said, um, in this field of food addiction recovery, 100 pound weight loss is actually, is actually not that unusual. Um, in some of the uh, circles that I travel, I mean, people are talking about triple digit weight loss over years, and I'm just astounded. I thought at one point 100 pounds, hey, you're pretty good, but go, wow, you know, 150 pounds, 160 pounds, holy cow. It, it really is quite amazing. And it is definitely unusual in the larger population, but in the food recovery, when we get the concept of addiction, it's not that unusual. So message of hope for people listening. Yeah. Uh, it's actually not that unusual once you get it. And hopefully this podcast will be part of the process of getting it. But my story was, um, uh, you know, probably a 30 year trajectory of getting it. You know, I, I had to do it the slow way, like many of us. Um, I started off in my 20s, like so many young women um, in university, uh, you know, gaining and losing weight. And, you know, when I look at pictures of myself now, I think, you know, you weren't that big, Vera. Like, what's the problem here? But I thought I was and um, restricted my diet and then found that I got caught in that um, restricting and, and overeating binging pattern that just typically happens when you start restricting. Um, and it got to the point where... Uh, it dominated my, I call it my mental landscape. It just dominated everything. Um, and so much so that I uh, ended up going to the hospital, the emergency saying, if you don't, if you don't admit me, then I will binge the whole night. Please admit me just to keep me away from myself. And, and this was in the seventies. Uh, I was in my twenties and they didn't know what to do. Like it, the, the a concept of binge eating disorder and eating disorders was just starting then. And um, I think they just thought, you're not trying to kill yourself, go away, you know, go away. Um, and uh, I had to uh, spend a fair amount of time trying to self-regulate my eating, which dominated, you know, and, and now that I have the language of addiction, I can see the things that I was trying to do, like the geographical cure. I went to London. I was part of that generation where, you know, we travel in between um, you know, high school and university. And I thought if I uh, went and traveled for a couple of years, I would somehow be away from food and be so engrossed in everything, I wouldn't want to eat. But of course, what did I do? I was in my own room somewhere, not going and seeing the, you know, the Tower of London or the whatever, um, Virginia Woolf Walk. I didn't do any, I was eating. I was eating, I was focused on eating. So my story was uh, one of, um, uh, food obsession from my 20s. Now, I started with alcohol before that. I had ha came from an alcoholic family. So I really don't know if 
food is my primary or alcohol is my primary. And, and bottom line, I don't care because the behavior was the same. Um, when I stopped drinking, um, which was in high school, pardon me, um, university, because it was in the way of my studies, um, I started eating. And then later, years later, when I wanted to lose weight, I wanted to drink again. So to me, it's the same thing. Um, anyway, um, I want to make this a short story, shorter story than it's becoming. Um, it wasn't until I got into the field of addiction and started to um, see how people um, used alcohol and used cocaine. And that's when I started to think, boy, this really looks the same. Even though I intuitively felt it, seeing it outside of myself. Um, and, and I had tried to quit and like so many people was able to lose weight, but then would gain it again. And, and, uh, what would happen is I'd have a year or two of doing really well. I don't eat sugar. Um, and then there'd be the inevitable Christmas or the inevitable birthday and somebody would make the wonderful cheesecake and I would feel like, Oh, it's been a year, just have some. And then I'd be back in again. Um, and I could never understand why that happened. Uh, until the, I, I became an addictions physician, partly because of my family history and all that kind of, it just got interested in that field. I just one day said, I'm going to treat this like an addiction, even though it sounds weird to do that. Um, and uh, I knew I could quit. I did, but I'm going to stay quit by just saying, it's just like booze. It's just like a cigarette. Once you quit, you don't pick up again. And that made all the difference about 15 years ago. So 15 years ago, I quit sugar completely. Um, and then in my travels, is this too long of a story here? No, not at all. This is great. Okay. All right. Cause I can, you know, we, we want to talk about other stuff besides me. Um, uh, in my travels, um, I wanted to talk about this. Hey, look at this connection, but people would just, you know, look at me askance. Like, this is just weird. How can food be a, a, an addiction? But it wasn't until, um, the American Society of Addiction Medicine published their first journal on addiction, process addictions, including food, by wonderful Dr. Nora Volkov. I mean, she's my hero. She's a, a physician um, in that, in that uh, large addictions um, board of uh, addiction medicine. Um, she started talking about it, and then I thought, well, if she can talk about it, so can I. So I started talking about it. That enabled me to meet people who also quit flour. So I thought, oh, flour, oh my God, how am I gonna quit flour? That's like muffins, that's like uh, bread, that's like, you know, come on. Um, but they said, no, quit sugar, quit flour, big difference. And so I think I lost maybe 60 pounds from sugar, that enabled me to lose another 20 pounds. So it's like, okay, great. Still had obsessions, wanting to eat, but I could handle it. So sugar and flour, I think works for a lot of people. And then finally, four years ago, now almost five years ago, I met another group of people who also added grains. So no sugar, no flour, grains, no grains, which means rice and quinoa and all this apparently healthy stuff. Um, and I thought, I'm just gonna try and see if I can get rid of that last bit of weight that just won't go off. Um, and also just help the last bit of cravings and it did so almost five years ago i quit sugar flour grains and got the magic hundred um uh, which i had in the past but now it stayed um and i've maintained that so i guess now for five years but i was like 90 pounds 100 pounds before that but i would keep kind of wavering back and forth mm -hmm. and it's been steady since then and i'm convinced that four or five years ago is when i was um, definitely well into menopause. And I know we're going to talk about this at some point, if not today, some other time, maybe that menopause is a sort of really, I think that's when women become extra heightened, extra carb sensitive. Maybe mm -hmm. I'll just call it that. And so where I might've been able to get away with grains before and hit that hundred pound mark, I couldn't anymore. And I wouldn't touch them now you know, because I'm well into menopause. So that's the long story. Once I, once I got the idea that this is an addiction and treated it that way, it was a game changer. Yeah, that is just amazing. And I really appreciate you taking the time to tell the full story because I think so many listeners really benefit from hearing because so many of the things that you were saying, even with studying abroad in London, substitute that for me for Australia, same yeah. thing, like in my room eating chocolates and everything and not actually being able to enjoy. I mean, I still did stuff too, but I yeah. spent a lot of time eating in my room. So I think so many people yeah. can relate to that and it just helps us feel 
a little less alone, you know, in this whole. Yeah. And you know, even, even when I did the stuff like the, the touring outside of my room, I was still thinking about my room and when can I get back and you know, yeah. binge. Or what something. am I gonna eat next? Exactly, yeah. yeah. And I also love the added component now of no grains. So I've talked before in my podcast that I'm pretty certain that I'm entering perimenopause and would love if we don't get into that today to talk another time more about that and what the hormone changes do. Um, to yeah. sugar addiction and realizing that, well, we might have to make some more changes. Um, what's working today might not necessarily work for us tomorrow. And yeah, exactly. you, know, you might have to eliminate grains altogether. Right now, I, I still eat them, but that is something that I've heard not just from you, but other yeah. uh, people in sugar recovery that have gone through menopause. So that's something that I am definitely gonna keep in mind, and I'm glad to know have that knowledge before yeah. entering, and then I could see myself being really frustrated, like what's happening? And then sometimes just weight yeah. gain itself can be a trigger for some people, and yeah. you know, could pull up some bad habits. So I'm just really glad that we even just put that knowledge out there for people as a consideration. Yeah. Um, and I'm excited, because so what we were gonna really talk about today or focus about, is food addiction as a syndrome and how it's you know a progressive thing so yeah. if you can talk a little more about that that would be great yeah i will but can i just let me go back for a second and and uh, i just thought i'd like to add something to um the so i'm doing the no sugar no flour no grains mm -hmm. i just want to say that um so I'm coming from the addiction framework and that's where I want to stay. That's my shtick. That's, that's, the, that's what helps me. And I, I think it's what mm -hmm. helps a lot of people. But I think that what's happened um, in the sort of um, internet world of all the various food plans that people do, that the keto plan is very big now. Mm -hmm. And I think that part of the reason why it's big is that people without realizing it stumbled upon one type of food addiction friendly program because keto is very no sugar no flour and cut down the grains or knock them out and and they feel great and they say there's no cravings because they essentially hit a food addiction program mm -hmm. and and if they stayed there probably without even knowing it um are you know doing a food addiction program and when people fall off of that uh it's because if they it, you know if they get that piece of information that yes it's a good plan for them and it's also food addiction friendly, they might realize that's why I better not have the little processed goodie uh, that has sugar in it, even though it might be 10 carbs for the day and I'm allowed to have it, mm -hmm. to, to just have that piece of information, but I can't have it because it is not food addiction friendly to have that. Because you know, keto, like all the other Pro, uh, food plants have their little processed packages that make yes. you like, you're like the keto food. bars and the ke exactly. keto exactly. peanut butter cups and I'm thinking yeah, yeah. Yeah, I still so the, can't eat that. <laughs> yeah. so, so a person who's doing well on keto and suddenly finds that they're not look to their food and see if in fact they have transgressed the food addiction rules which are no sugar no flour no grains and it's probably in those products so yeah. I just wanted to say that because um yeah, that's a really good point because there's probably some people that are doing keto yeah. that do well with those products because they're not addicted to sugar, but yeah. it might for some people that are. Well, you know, they, or they might become so because yeah. Because now we're going to talk about the food addiction syndrome, um, yeah. and uh, you know things change over time. So somebody could have gotten like I could get away with grains in my 30s. I I can't now. So so um, I I had wanted to talk about the food addiction syndrome because. Now, uh, when you listen on podcasts and discussions about food addiction, it's not that unusual to hear people talking about, you know, food is addictive. It's like cocaine in the brain or food, but specifically sugar and flour and, and um, some food behaviors um, are very addictive. And, and people get that. I think that's, I, I don't want to say they completely get it, but it's not new information anymore. Um, so I want to say, let's, let's move the conversation along now into um, the um, phenomenon of what happens in the next five or ten years once you've been uh, um, you, you've, you've been exposed to sugar uh, what happens over time and it's just like anybody has a couple of cigarettes they're not a smoker but if they've been smoking for five or ten years and it's been regular and daily and more every day and every day pretty soon they're a smoker 
So what does a smoker look like versus the occasional smoker? So what does an addict, a sugar addict look like versus somebody who eats addictive sugar and can put it down? And, and when we start talking about it's become um, a condition that I have that has its own momentum, that's what I'm talking about. That's the syndrome. Yeah. So I, I know that you talked, um, uh, um, I don't remember who it was with, was it with Mike? The, the um, idea of, of, the, of the DSM criteria of addiction and how mm -hmm. food fits that. I, I, don't, I, I don't need to, to talk about that now, do I? Like, I think, are, are we good with that one? Um, yeah, I think we kind of yeah. covered that, yeah. So the, you know, the criteria of addiction, of, of, of uh, obsession and impairment yeah. and inability to say no and, and uh, um, uh, denial, all features of addiction. Mm -hmm. um, and, and when a person is eating sugar and can put it down, you know, what, what we try to see with the new DSM-5 criteria is it's not like an either or, it's like almost like a continuum of from zero to 11 um, criteria. And if you're six or seven or eight out of 11, you're more in the thick of the, you're basically a moderate to severe food addict versus mm -hmm. mild. And a mild food addict might be able to go to uh, Weight Watchers or, or do a, um, a keto and not pay attention to the occasional nibble of something else uh, and get away with it. But if a person is, is gradually getting more and more exposed to sugar and more and more biochemical changes happen and be, become ingrained, become ingrained, like neurologically ingrained, then there's no going back and, and um, a, a syndrome develops, which has its own momentum, um, which means that it's kind of like uh, um, once you're a diabetic, even though you're eating well and your sugars are good, you're always a diabetic, right? Mm -hmm. you, 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 um, uh, you, your sugars might be fine, but the moment you start eating badly, they shoot way up far more than somebody else. And, and similarly with uh, food addiction, the syndrome, once the person's uh, neurological changes have become so ingrained, um, so I want to say impaired and, and um, um, uh, compensated for that that you're good as long as you're not eating sugar you look like every other normal person but the moment you have it, 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 it you, you go sky high with cravings mm -hmm. instead of sugar uh, pardon me instead of blood sugar with the diabetic going sky high it's cravings that are going sky mm -hmm. high with the food addict consequently in the language of addiction we say um uh you, you know uh one is too many and a thousand is not enough because one will lead to the thousand because one will bring what we call the phenomena of craving that huge response that is typical of an addict versus a non-addict who doesn't have that huge response mm -hmm. and how does that huge response happen through persistent exposure and the neurological changes that try to adapt to that um, another term that people have talked about um, with food addiction is we know it's a, a dopamine phenomena because dopamine is the neurochemical of excitement and charge and that's what sugar does. And when you get a persistent barrage of dopamine through sugar, cocaine, alcohol, crystal meth, um, eventually you get a uh, receptor response and you could essentially say it's a dopamine impaired response. Mm -hmm. and dopamine impaired response is really the underlying underbelly mechanism of addiction. And so now you've got a dopamine impaired response, which can be compensated and look normal, but throw in this sugar and it has a, a huge reaction. Um, so that, that's why I believe that once you're a food addict, once you're a diabetic, once you're an addict of any sort, there's no going back. You may look like you're going back, but you're not. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really hard for a lot of people to understand or even just grasp. Um, if you suffer from sugar addiction yourself, but that totally makes sense to me that, you know, I've almost been sugar and flour free for two years, but I oh. know if I were to have yeah. just one bite of a cookie, it wouldn't be one bite. Like even now, oh, even yeah. if it's tempting to you down the road, yeah, that's just not going to work. And that's hard for people, I know. friends and family to understand too, yeah. well, you know, they Friends and family, let's put that one aside for me because that's a whole other topic. <laughs> but but even yourself, because remember, denial is part of this. Yeah, and denial is part of addiction. And 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 when when you have when you after two years have your cookie, the chances are not likely that you're going to go, wow, that's great, and you know, run to the cookie jar. What's probably most likely going to happen is you're going to go, well, then, you know, 
that wasn't so bad. Mm -hmm. I was able to stop. But you're going to notice that over the course of the evening, you're going to go start going back to that cookie. And it's going to be like, you know, that wasn't so bad. It was kind of nice. It, it's like this sneaky little craving thing, uh -huh. which by, by three days from now, you're going to be thinking, that wasn't so bad. Why don't I have another one? Mm -hmm. and, and within a week or two or three weeks, the same thing happens with alcohol. You know, it's not the first drink. Yet we say it's the first drink. And it might be for some people, but it's most likely um, the first drink starts the phenomena of craving. And then if a person's had years of saying no, then it might take actually a couple of weeks, but then they'll have another one because they said, hey, it wasn't so bad. And then before they know it, in a month or two or three months, sometimes it takes six months for me to see somebody back in treatment and go, oh, you're back. Yeah, because I had one and then before you know it, I was having one every day and then one every whatever. So, mm -hmm. so it's the sneaky little, oh, it wasn't so bad. I think I can do it. That's likely what would happen. That's, that's what would happen to me if I were to pick up. And it alters, like you called, I like that you called it the mental landscape, you know, yeah. that's where yeah. just, oh, that wasn't so bad. Just one more bite. You know, those yeah. thoughts start coming back again, where you yeah, start yeah, yeah. assessing again, like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. there's some more cookies on that plate. You, you yeah, ate yeah, one. Yeah. I'm sure you could just eat one more. And yeah, yeah. And you don't see it, but up. even as I'm watching you say that, mm -hmm. I, I'm thinking, man, would a non-food addict be even having this conversation? No. <laughs> no. Yeah. It it wouldn't even be part of their landscape. They'd be thinking about whatever they were doing. Um, so, you know, you're in the thick, I mean, I'm, I know that you're just giving an example, but I've yeah. seen people do this and, and, and it's, it's the denial that's speaking. Now that's not me. Don't worry about it. Because you wouldn't even be having this conversation. This is a sign of the addiction. Yes. But you don't see it because it's denial. Yeah. Denial is like this delusion. It's like the schizophrenic sitting on the sidewalk going, uh, I know that God is speaking through me and everyone else is going, this guy is in a delusional <laughs> disorder. They don't see it. Um, but it's so obvious to everybody else. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I believe that wholeheartedly. And, you know, I'd interviewed someone um, who had thought perhaps he had healed his sugar addiction and would be yeah. able to start eating it again. And I think he was seeing the slippery slope that it actually yeah. Game. So I think that's overwhelming too when you're, yeah. it's overwhelming to give it up at all and then to know that it's forever, you know, that's a whole second that's, part that you really just have to wrap your brain around. Little voice that's there just whispering away. Yeah. Maybe not forever. Yeah. Like <laughs> trying to tell you, no, you won't have to do this forever. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 You would even say, you know, because you've been pretty much 15 years, right? Sugar and yeah. flour free. You would well, sugar you free, flour that. free, probably eight years. Okay. And, and total of, of all three of them, about now almost five years. So you would have that same reaction, though, if you were to have. Oh, yeah. 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 And, 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 I, and, you know, when we talk about, uh, I, I, I can't. I have to admit there are days when I still think, oh, it would be nice to have such and such, especially if I smell something, walk by mm -hmm. something, whoa. Um, but I've learned uh, because I have a, I mean, I'm also in a program where I'm every day uh, sort of being alert to these whispering little sneaky voices. Yeah. So I go, right, I get, I get that. Um, I, I, mean, I can see right away what's happening and I can stop it. But, you know, if I were alone in the world out there with my friends who are saying, Oh, Vera, you're doing, you're still doing that. Mm -hmm. you know, I, 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 even today, after four or five years of everything and 10 years of sugar, I'd be tempted. Like it, it's like the voices are still there, but they're much less. Mm -hmm. You know, there are two out of 10 as opposed to our 11 out of 10. Yeah. Yeah. And it is amazing how just even a smell, like you were saying, you walk by a bakery or just yeah. catch a whiff of something, it can just, yeah, right away, almost overwhelm you. And I have to always remind myself, nope, don't do that anymore. Because it yeah. just takes me right back to, I yeah. want that, basically. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so you had asked me about talking about the syndrome itself. So yeah. what I want to say about that is that once you, once um, me as a clinician um, recognizes so I'm going to be thinking about somebody else, not me, Vera, but somebody else sitting in front of me, maybe as a patient, um, uh, talking to me about something like at, at the very beginning in the early mild stages, because everyone goes through mild to moderate to severe, some more quickly than others. Um, I can make the assessment, okay, this person is in a fairly mild stage. And, and so therefore a keto plan or a paleo plan or um even maybe Weight Watchers, although I don't think that that's, you know, throw that one out because 
<laughs> you can screw around with points there and mm -hmm. just eat crap with your points. Um, but anyway, you, you can get away with a lot of stuff. But what we, we see with, you know, that, that dopamine impairment over time, constant exposure, you get more and more um, less normal response, more heightened response. And the syndrome develops just like it does with cigarette smoking and with even coffee drinking. You need more to get the same effect, which means more exposure, which means more damage to the receptors. And so it's not this quiet, you know, you're on and that's it. It's a, it's a beast that gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and the syndrome uh, becomes um, a, a clinical phenomena which looks the same uh, of the obsession and the impairment and, and people say the same things. And, you know, like you say, a lot of people can relate to what I'm saying uh, because the syndrome is the same. It, mm -hmm. It's like a diabetic feels the same as another diabetic when they're crashing on sugar. Uh, like it has its own clinical syndrome. And, and that might seem obvious when you're working in the field, but um, as, we, as we shook our head so many times, when you talk to another clinician who doesn't buy this concept, they'll go, yes, yeah, some foods are addictive, but there's no actual condition. Come on. Mm -hmm. There is. Yeah. It's a developed a phenomena like any other addiction. Um, and uh, I, I want to say it's a condition and it gets worse. Uh, I'm calling it a syndrome because it may, um, uh, it, it's fueled by the same thing, this impaired dopamine response. It has a lot of the same behaviors, but your version is going to be a little bit different than mine because yours might include some food behaviors like food restricting. Somebody else it's not, it's just binging. Some people will do the, uh, I just, I, okay, I don't eat sugar, I don't eat flour, I don't even eat grains, but I eat way too many avocados, you know, or peanut butter, or like, even if it's clean peanut butter, like, th then it becomes a volume addiction, like, mm -hmm. becomes more than just um, specific foods, it can become behaviors too. All of that, I think, fits into this concept of a syndrome, which is a condition in and of itself. Yeah, I'm so glad you say that, because there are many people that don't believe in the syndrome or the condition yeah, or right. even, you know I've talked recently with a friend who I was trying to explain it to and he was admitting that the behavior sounded very similar to you know like an alcoholic or a drug yeah. addict yeah but still didn't feel like it was as serious as maybe one of those and that's what's frustrating for me yeah because you don't really even understand how serious it is unless you're the one suffering from it. But trying to explain that to yeah. other people that just don't get it. Yeah. It but you know, really hard. The, the problem, the reason why we don't think it's so serious is because it takes longer. Like if you actually think about it, food addiction is the most prevalent and the most uh, cost consuming addiction in our society, but we don't call it food addiction. So people die. What are the leading causes of death? Stroke, cancer, heart disease. Where, where, what feeds those? I mean, yes, everybody will die of a heart attack or a stroke when they're nine, like, you know, old age, eventually you have to die. But people are dying in their 60s and their 70s when they should still be young, maybe not young and virile, but young enough. I mean, I'm 63 now and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm healthy. Well, point is, is a lot of people my age are already getting walkers. They're already, you know, six, six medication, like a list of medications, yeah. diabetes, high cholesterol, et cetera, et cetera. And we'll like are on the path to, um, uh, I'm already having friends die of cancer and having heart attacks. Mm -hmm. And where does that come from? But food. Right. Um, and, and, uh, but we don't, if we don't link it to that, it's not going to look as bad as the crack addict. Mm -hmm. the crack addict is, is extreme because they're on the street. We don't see the food addict because they're in the uh, intensive care ward or in the ICU or, or uh, even just the hospital ward dying of getting their legs chopped off and, uh, you know, um, because of diabetes. Uh, mm -hmm. um, and, and that could be a direct result of their food, their sugar intake. But we don't, if, we don't make, if we don't connect those dots, we're going to say it's not as serious. Mm -hmm. It just takes longer. Instead of dying tomorrow from an opiate overdose, healthy, and tomorrow you're dead, an over, you're going to die, but it'll be in 25 years or 20 mm -hmm. years, maybe 15 years. Let me say one more thing. And that is that I, I have met a, a, a few 
crystal meth addicts, crystal meth being one of the hardest addictions to stop because it is so uh, um, intense in the moment and, and will often age and, and devastate life within a year or two. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know any crystal meth addicts who are occasional users, not for long, um, will say that sugar was harder to quit. Wow. And, you know, I believe them. And they say because it's this persistent little voice every, I guess it's like smoking cigarettes. Some people will say smoking was harder to quit than cocaine because you're used to doing it all the time. Well, sugar, we're used to doing it all the time. Um, mm -hmm. But it's even more sneaky than cigarettes. So... Well, just because it's added, you know, that's what was such a shock to me when I was trying yeah. to get up is when I always say, read your labels, read your labels, read your labels. Yeah. And three months in, yeah. I would be surprised, like, are you kidding me? There's added sugar. And it comes in so many different names and forms. I mean, you really have to like, yeah. know, you know, memorize like a list of a hundred different words, but it's just added to so many yeah. things that we don't even... Yeah. realize it sometimes thinking we are eating healthy when we're not so yeah. well you know i think it, i think it's bitten uh in sweden who says uh if it's got a label you know it's processed <laughs> you know it's it's there you go be wary be wary you know yeah. and and uh i who is it um oh, the guy who says eat eat uh, real food eat mod oh, i can't remember what his name is now anyway famous guy chef anyway the idea is um if you eat real food you're you're already on good ground exactly yeah yeah if you have to look at the ingredient list that's when you start getting in trouble <laughs> yeah yeah so let's talk a little bit more about because i think the food syndrome concept yeah. is yes. really important and about how then you know some plans might work for some people and not other people and how it might change yes. you, as we were talking about earlier to what works for you today might not tomorrow exactly so what, what once once you buy into the concept of this is a food addiction syndrome this is a clinical syndrome that has its own sort of momentum then uh then that then the next thing is just to look at treatment so how do we treat this either self-treat or treat as a clinician um and uh, uh where the person is i mean Ideally, it would if we could um, do no sugar, no flour, no grains for everybody. It would everybody it would it would benefit everybody. I think now maybe the people who are plant based will disagree with me. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. I mean, where we come to um, at least some common understanding is is we both shake our heads at processed foods. Mm -hmm. like, you know, uh, it just you know if we just go with real food, whatever that is, we're already way ahead. But I, I'm I'm going to um, admit my bias right here that I, I, I can't really speak to the plant-based people who might be listening. Uh, mm -hmm. I just don't have enough experience. I know there are people who work in food addiction who are also very uh, keen on the vegan uh, um, um, sort of front, but that's not gonna be me. Um, mm -hmm. Not to say it's wrong, just it's, uh, it's not my expertise. Um, so, so it, it, you know, if you could do like the um, no sugar, no flour, no grains, and, and you know, no restricted behavior, like, you know, we even will go as far in the addiction world as weighing and measuring. Um, only because it doesn't allow you to cheat by restricting or overindulging on healthy food. It's a way to contain um, uh, in that way. But so if everybody did that, that would be great. So basically, if we ate like we ate 100 years ago, where the plates were smaller and the, the social mores, you didn't actually have to carry a scale because the social mores were such that you just didn't need to pick out when you went out with, you know, you ate moderately. And then you went home and the expectation was is that you didn't eat in front of, like you ate when you ate and then you didn't eat. The, the social mores helped portion control. We don't have that anymore. The social mores are now just eat whenever you want, including people eating when they come into my office, you know, like eating all the time or slurping on something. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, uh, that would work. But, but it, 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 in the context of a syndrome, if you're earlier on, you may not have to do that whole thing. And if you're a clinician or you working with somebody wants to um, present something, it might be more palatable to that person who's going, what, I can't eat sugar and now flowers and now grains. Um, well, okay, let's just, let's just quit the sugar. And that might be enough for that person because they're early days. Um, and, and it's, it's an easier sell than trying to push the whole thing. But if you get somebody who comes to you with bariatric surgery, weight regain, they're on their knees crying, going anything, I'd say give them the whole works mm -hmm. because it'll work. 
And then with the help of a coach or a sponsor or somebody, not only not themselves alone, you might be able to reintroduce carefully um, some behaviors or um, maybe grains or maybe like some people can't eat dairy try it or not like you know sweeteners is another one that is uh um depending on where you are on the syndrome you can or can't have it or get away with it um so that kind of tweaking of the individual person um uh yeah i i i don't i don't know if there's more to say about it but just that the clinician you as the helper of the person um it has to be somebody not the person because the person is going to say everything is okay Yes. Yeah. Right. Um, but the clinician will go, okay, um, did you read the labels? You're having something, what's going on? And then help them to either maintain the whole umbrella of every, quitting all the addictive triggering behaviors, foods to maybe we don't have to go that far. Maybe we can go here. Um, and uh, that's the piece where uh, basically to individualize the plan. Yeah. And I think it's realizing for people listening that it is, such a journey like it's yeah. going to be your own personal journey that's why yeah. i don't try to say this is the only way to do it because i don't believe there's just one way to do it right. what works for me might not work for somebody else and exactly. i did by just starting giving up sugar and did that probably i don't know 30 different times and could never get past 30 days for me it was the yeah adding taking out flour too that yes. finally got exactly. it to yeah. stick, that I was able to go longer. But like you were saying, someone else that might be less yeah. addicted than I might be able to, because I was seeing that all the time. I would be doing a whole 30, yeah. you know, a group of people from my gym or friends, and everyone's having these amazing results. And I felt like crap the whole month <laughs> and thought, no, yeah. I really just need to have sugar. I'm a person that just has to eat it. Yeah. Uh, and I just realized, and I knew too for measuring food and that to me wasn't appealing at first. I thought, you know, it's going to be really hard just to give up sugar and flour and at least to start, I'm just going to do that. Yes. Um, yes. And do that piece first and try, my goal was to do it for a full year because I knew it was going to not be a 30 day magical sugar detox, <laughs> yeah. sugar, you know, that it was going to take some time that I've had these bad habits for a really long time. And, you know, at least a year was what's going to. Yeah. It took me about five months really before I started feeling, you know, a lot better. And yeah. then I never feel like I'm white knuckling it anymore. You know, when I was still trying to eat flour exactly. or yeah. do substitutes too, because people do ask me that a lot. Well, what do yeah. you substitute? And I'm like, I don't substitute. I don't have like a sugar flour free muffin that I have no. or treat. You know, I'm just right. eating real food now. Yeah, yeah. Not substituting it with other things because when I was right. doing that that was the slippery slope um that yeah. you know, kept feeding that addictive behavior of wanting more 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 yeah um, so like that that keto bar or yeah. whatever it is you know yeah. that's that's the thing so the person feels like they're white knuckling and the, and the thing about the syndrome too is I, I I think you kind of alluded to this earlier you might have, you might be doing really well on the uh, no sugar no flour and then the occasional keto bar and suddenly that doesn't work anymore mm -hmm. and it, you won't know that it's not working anymore except that you're just not so satisfied anymore and you're starting to look at you know oh look at these bars or maybe I can try this which is basically a sign of craving mm -hmm. uh, something is feeding that craving and so then like you said read the label read the label read the label so yes. the other terminology is look to the food look to the food look to the food. Yeah. what is the food that's bringing back this craving mm -hmm. um, and it might be that now uh, where you could eat uh, grains before now you can't or yeah. maybe you could eat dairy now you can't maybe you could eat sweeteners and try and stop them like you got to find out what it is that's feeding that so you get that mental peace again mm -hmm. the serenity that, that we all desire mm -hmm. that you might have had but over time things change i don't know why i don't know why but i see it happening mm -hmm. you know? I, w one of the uh, counselors that I work with uh, was in uh, a program and uh, found that she was starting to gain weight and not changing her food. And um, uh, she was still eating grain because she was in a program that allowed for that. And then, and then uh, just de de decided one day, I don't care if they say I can eat grain, I'm just going to stop. And it made all the difference. And why? Well, uh, I'm going to say it's because of menopause, something happened at, yeah. at an age of at, at time. And it's been my experience that, um, uh, uh, women really suffer in menopause and that if they're eating grains reducing that might might take 
a significant punch away from mm -hmm. the pain of that. Yeah. yeah, and I hear even, you know, women that aren't necessarily addicted to sugar that struggle mm -hmm. Um, with menopause and, you know, not changing anything in their diet or exercise and suddenly yeah. having like 10 or 15 extra pounds, especially in their like stomach areas. Yes. I hear women talking about this all the time um, and just naturally kind of start going more towards a keto diet or restricting, you know, starting yeah. to take away their grains yeah. and carbs. And yeah, like they're becoming more insulin resistant and you yeah. know, we just say carb sensitive. And so they're yeah. going to have to reduce carbs even more. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's so, yeah, I wonder, do you, you know, cause since you do work with a lot of people, do you see this same kind of challenges for men? Obviously they don't have to worry about menopause, but do you see kind of their food cravings or anything change or? Um, no, I would have to say um, two things. I don't work with men enough to see the age change. Mm -hmm. I definitely see men pick up food, uh, pop, a lot of pop. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're generally um, not as weight conscious until a certain point and then they are. And so by the time they're weight conscious, they've already developed some pretty serious habits that mm -hmm. are not in their favor. But usually what I, what one thing I do know about men is that women immediately go to the baked goods and the obvious sweet stuff. Men have a tendency to do more like, um, like one guy I know who works in this field says it's the kryptonite foods. It's the uh, chicken wings and the, uh, um, uh, the, the, the highly uh, processed meats that have a lot of sugar and oil in them. And, mm -hmm. and it doesn't look so much uh, like um, uh, uh, bad food, but it is. Yeah. Um, and, and it's not so much that it's the meat, it's how it's prepared um, and the stuff that it comes with, like the chips, the French fries, the, all that kind of stuff. Um, Yes. So it's a little more disguised. So men, in my experience, and this is limited, I have to admit, um, uh, tend to, uh, if they're going to be addicted, tend to go to booze first. And then when they quit the booze, they, they go to the food or they do the food like the, the, the um, kind of kryptonite, non-sugary, and then it moves into. Mm -hmm. That's that's sort of my experience. Uh, but men tend to not, uh, anytime you have a food addiction program, our program, they're not the ones that are coming for help. They're coming for their um, alcoholism. And it's more women that struggle with food overtly. Like you go to a Weight Watchers meeting, I don't know how many men are in there. There might be a yeah. few, but generally yeah. men are, are not seeking help. Maybe because it's acceptable to be a certain weight until it's no longer acceptable. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. That's what just makes me curious about like the hormone. I'm just so interested in hormones, yeah. I mean, polycystic ovary syndrome when I was yeah. younger. So I'm just so curious about the hormones role in, if it is kind of related. Although I also know when I was four or five, I, my sugar addiction started. I would, you know, sneak downstairs before anyone got up, would get into uh -huh. the cookie jar and just eat as many cookies as I could until someone woke up. Yeah. So obviously hormones weren't quite in play. No, 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 no. But there was a little addict in the making there. Yeah, yeah. So wow. that, that's uh, when it's so obvious, when it's a little kid, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, Wow. Um, well, we only have a little bit of time left. Um, I don't know what you wanted, if there was anything that we kind of missed talking about that maybe you wanted to tell the audience, or if you wanted to talk a little bit more about your clinic and your treatment center, whatever yeah. you kind of want to share yeah. with us. Okay, so so uh, our food addiction program, which is unfortunately only available to Canadians just because mm -hmm. of the, the legalities of it, um, the liability, the legalities of it, um, is a, a program that follows this kind of umbrella approach of let's just assume that if you've, if you've gone to the point where you're seeking treatment and willing to pay for it, because the government won't, won't pay for something that doesn't exist. The food addiction doesn't exist as far as uh, the medical community is concerned right now. Um, so if you're going willing to go to that extent, that means you're pretty serious. You're pretty devast You're pretty willing to do anything. So we do the whole no sugar, no flour, no grains. And the success rate, at least while they're in the program, which is a month, is amazing, mm -hmm. the, the inpatient program. Like it usually takes two to three weeks. So I'm telling you this, not because we're trying to get you guys to come to my program, because you can't. Most of the people here are probably uh, not Canadians looking for help. I'm, I'm right about that, right? <laughs> well, hopefully, maybe there's a few people we can help. So. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, um, 
the reason why I'm trying to say this is that if you go all out and do this, the, the um, you know, people go, oh my God, how will I do this? Uh, that all is, is the first reaction that a person has and it lasts for about a week and then two weeks later, things are easier. And by the third week and certainly by the fourth week, people are smiling and sailing. I don't have cravings anymore. I'm good, no problem. And they really are good. Like it only takes that long. Um, so, so that's the good news. And I see that all the time in our program. Where the problem is, is of course, once they leave, it's the very same thing as any other addiction. You walk back out there and, and, and um, you know, you, you have a drink of alcohol and then you're toast. You have um, somebody offer you some cake and you're toast. Like it's, it's, it's staying sober. And, and um, I have a lot of people say, uh, send me emails saying, okay, Dr. Tarn, what should I do? What kind of food? And, and I, I, I want to say, I, 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 this is a food program, but it is a program of addiction recovery. So that means that there's a whole other piece. It's not just about the food. food the food is only the first piece. Get clean and sober. That takes about three weeks. Now, the rest of your life is going to be maintaining that sobriety. Mm -hmm. And that means relapse prevention tools. That means getting your social support network in your favor. And we mentioned this earlier. That is so hard to do because people don't buy this and and uh, uh, if you don't really and you know the whole idea about plan prepare protect make sure when you go out there that people are not going to support your food plan so have backup food all those things this this is all relapse prevention it's what do I do to first things first maintain my sobriety this is all the language of addiction and and uh, uh, it doesn't mean that you're imprisoned in an addictive mentality oh you think you're an addict the rest of your life it's these are the tools that i will use to protect myself so that i can live freely mm -hmm. in my world uh it's actually i think it's liberating uh because i'm not worried about uh oh my god what's the next meal because if if i, if I don't like the next meal i've got one in my back you know my in my car trunk like it, it's it's like there's a a liberation in uh um yeah, so I, I don't know if there's anything more to say about that. But anyway, so that that's food addiction is the food and then then how to stay sober after that. And I believe it's a lifetime. But it's easy. Like once you got it down, it's like how many people who are listening are previous smokers? Do you still think about your cigarettes? No. Mm -hmm. And it gets easier and easier as more and more friends quit. And the ex expectation is that there's no smoking. Now my third goal, so first it was quit food, then it was relapse prevention. Now it's political societal change so that I don't have to think about it ever because it's never in my face. Mm -hmm. So doing podcasts like this, uh, you know, getting with Robert Lustig and, and you know, changing policy so mm -hmm. that, that it's not in our face all the time. And it's in fact the norm to not offer cheesecake yeah. the moment somebody walks into your house. Mm -hmm. you know, would you like a glass of water? Can I, can I get you something else? No, thank you. Okay, fine. You know, do, just be as simple as that. Yeah. 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 Without the, Oh, I made it just for you. And you know, we get into that whole nonsense. Mm -hmm. so, um, I, I, I really want to say that um, uh, ultimately that th this is a message of liberation. Uh, there's a little bit of pain, but it's not as much pain as it feels two or three weeks. And then the rest is liberation and um, just maintaining vigilance. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's really well said. And I'm going to make sure that I link at the bottom of this episode, your website. And I also just wanted to point out, because I do get a lot of emails from people asking me if I'm on Facebook, which I'm not on social media, but you actually have a sugar-free support group um, on Facebook. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. It's, called, uh, yeah, it's called, I'm sweet enough. Uh, the uh, sugar, uh, the sugar-free for life Facebook support group. Perfect. So I'm going to put the website on there. Yeah. And also get my book, um, Food Junkies, yes. Recovery from Food Addiction. Oh, yeah. And I did want to mention I had talked to Vera offline before we started recording this, but I had bought that book, you know, maybe just when I was starting this journey a little over two years ago. And huh. so um, I just reread it. I was telling her when I was on the plane coming back east from being back east last week. And it's still just it's on the Kindle, but I just wanted to underline every single word. So I just think it is a must read. She, you just came out with a new edition in January. Just yeah, new information. 
So that's what I kind of linked to, uh, link the book to underneath as well. But please read it because there's so much good information. And if you're anywhere like I was when I started, I just felt so alone. And this will just hmm. prove to you that you are not crazy. <laughs> you are yeah. not alone and that you have resources. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you so much for being with me today. I really appreciate yeah, thank it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. Have a great day. And remember, life is so much sweeter without sugar. Thank you.